Thank you all for joining us today for the Small Business Commissioner's webinar on Healthy People and Healthy Workplace. My name is Nerissa Kilbert. Uh, this is my first uh, webinar that I'm able to open as Acting Small Business Commissioner. And I'm really looking forward to working with all of you as we continue to navigate these somewhat challenging times um, and continue to adapt, um, rebuild and thrive into a new chapter. I'd like to start today by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which we meet, the Gardner people of Adelaide Pay Plains, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to take this opportunity to remind people to regularly check in with the Small Business Commissioner website um, as a way to stay up to date with the latest related to Small Business and Stage. It's updated regularly and it always has some pretty valuable uh, resources for people to draw upon. Similarly, you'll see on the screen another, a number of other valuable resources which we encourage people to stay up to date um, and, and visit regularly, again, to stay on top of any emerging news um, for the business sector in South Australia. And lastly, don't forget to like us on Facebook and LinkedIn, uh, the way to stay informed about upcoming events, and to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can revisit past information sessions as you need to. Today I'm really pleased and grateful to be able to introduce to you Kylie Cox from Wellbeing SA and Mel Novak from Beyond Blue. As many of you are probably already aware, the month of October is Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, the aim of this campaign being to improve community awareness and interest in mental health and wellbeing. Some of the topics that will be covered today um, include the benefits of a healthy workplace, the importance of your individual wellbeing and how that influences a healthy workplace, and also providing you with some information about a really valuable free confidential mental health coaching program for new access. Lastly, just a quick reminder that all of our web uh, presentations are available by simply emailing the office. Um, the email address is sasbc at sa.gov.au and simply request a copy and one will be sent to you. So without further ado, I'll pass it across to our first presenter, Ben Kiley. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Narissa. Um, good morning, everyone. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kylie Cox. I'm the Senior Project Officer working at Wellbeing SA, which is a prevention arm uh, as a part of the Department of Health and Wellbeing. Um, a little bit about me, I guess, from a background perspective. It's nice just to um, take the opportunity to introduce myself and where I come from. So for me, I've got a nursing background and I've become um, a little bit hesitant, I guess, when you get to that point of looking after sick people all the time and thought there's got to be a way to prevent this. So I completed a Master of Public Health and have been working in health promotion. Uh, and then for the last six years, I've been working in workplace health and wellbeing, which is quite a passionate area for me now because we spend a lot of time at work. And I believe it's a great environment for us to be able to promote health and protect health. Um, you know, we also know that work is a protective factor overall for our health and so it's really important for us, one, to be employed and in a job and secondly, where a workplace is a good workplace. It's one where we really can thrive and our mental health and wellbeing can be so much stronger. So that's where I've come from and, and the reason why I'm so passionate about this area. Um, today we're going to um, be having a look at, I guess, what the difference is between individual well-being and workplace well-being because it comes with a slightly different headset. So I just want to orientate that to you and see how you go with that. Um, hopefully you can see that difference between what we're trying to achieve when we're talking about creating a healthy workplace and what that might look like. Um, we'll look at what the benefits are for that for yourself and your small business. And we'll also then have a look at some of the small steps that you can take to creating workplace wellbeing um, within your own workplace for yourself and your workers. And we're going to finish off, um, like you've heard by Narissa, with Mel talking about a fabulous service that's available to business owners in the new access program. Most of my presentation today is going to be guided by a fabulous guide that was produced called the Workplace Wellbeing Guide for Small Business. And you can find a copy of this on the Small Business Commission website for you to be able to download. And this booklet is you know, a very helpful guide that helps you consider your own individual health and wellbeing, 
but it also helps you to put some steps and actions in place to promote uh, and you know help your workers and employees flourish. So I encourage you to have a look at that guide in particular, but some of the elements I'll be going through today, of course, which will be very helpful. So to start off with, I guess, I just want to open up the conversation about, well, what is wellbeing? And um, for, for a lot of people, it's quite a nebulous concept, I guess. We think of um, wellbeing as being the absence of disease or injury or illness. So by not being unwell means that you're well. So there's wellbeing. Um, there's elements of it being this um, combination, I guess, of physical health and mental health and spiritual health. But we also then have elements coming in about financial health and how that impacts on our health and wellbeing. So it's quite a large, big scale. Um, but ultimately, the sense of well-being is linked to happiness and life satisfaction, and it comes down to a sense of feeling of well-being in a lot of ways. And so in short, you could probably describe well-being as how you feel about yourself and how you feel about your life. And the other element that I like to talk about when we think about well-being, in particular around mental health, is that it's on quite a continuum. So you can be what we'd like to say if you're thinking about a long line right now and one section being sort of, you know, in the red where you might be in crisis and your well-being is not doing very well. You might have signs and symptoms of anxiety and depression and not sleeping and really struggling. But up the other end, in the green section, you'd be thriving and feeling fulfilled. And so you're getting enough good sleep and you're getting enough good nutrition. You're feeling satisfied. You're feeling fulfilled. And so we, we go along this continuum of um, mental health and well-being in general in life and, and some days we might wake up and feel more like we're in this red to orange zone and at other times we might be feeling that we're in the green zone. And it's still important to understand that you may have a, a mental illness but that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't feel like you've got good well-being or you may have a physical disability but you still may feel like you've got good well-being. So our life satisfaction here in Australia is quite good. Most of us do feel like we've got good well-being and we feel like we've got a, um, you know, great health in a lot of ways, which is quite good. So um, I guess for a lot of people, if I asked you out there right now, what does well-being mean to you? It would probably mean a few different elements. And a report that was undertaken um, by Future That Works, ask this question out to workers. What is individual wellbeing? And as you can see from the slide here, for most people, it's about where they find this balance between physical, mental and spiritual health, um, or where people feel physically fit and mentally fit. Um, and for others, it's about more of that financial aspect, where there is aspects of house and income success are met. So when, you know, when we think that our, our needs are met in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we've got good wellbeing. So that's what we've got to think about when we think about individual wellbeing. And there's a different sense of that when we're thinking in a workplace, how that looks to what a healthy workplace is and what workplace wellbeing is. Because not only do you consider, need to consider yourself as an individual and your work as individual thoughts of what wellbeing means, we also need to look at what the workplace provides and what a healthy workplace is and how that might look. So to begin with just now, I want to introduce you to this concept of what is a healthy workplace. It's slightly sidestepped where when we're thinking about a healthy workplace, we're thinking one where managers and workers collaborate and are in a process of consultation and talking with each other to consider how the workplace can promote and protect health, safety and wellbeing. So many workplaces will utilise either work health and safety as a backbone to this, or some will use human resources as a backbone to this in regards to retaining your staff. And as a small business, that's something that's, you know, we see um, so important that staff are retained and they stay with you for a long time. So you're not constantly having to recruit and you know, leaving you in the lurch as such. So where you're able to create this workplace where you're collaborating with your employees around how can you make the environment the best that it can be for health and wellbeing. 
And that means the physical work environment, so what the, the physical work environment is providing. It also means looking after mental health and physical health. Um, it also means the personal resources that your staff come with, so some of those elements of individual wellbeing. And it's, and another element to this is how you can participate in the community more broadly because we all come to work with families or we're connected in with community. Uh, and there's opportunities when we think about workplace health and wellbeing where we can connect in with community and that might be through volunteering or um, sponsoring or you know, if you're doing days that might be able to raise money for other organisations for the good of the community um, and you can do that within your workplace setting. So when we think about this element of um, workplace as an area of wellbeing, it's slightly different. And there are um, some great tools and resources about how you can do this within your workplace by going to the healthyworkplaces.sa.gov.au website. Um, it is um, going to help support you to get through this phase, I guess, when we talk about it being um, a four-step process. First of all, gaining leadership, support and buy-in and understanding why it's important. And then it's important then to do your needs assessment and understand your staff and your employees and what's required in the workplace. And then deciding on what actions you can put in place that are going to be supported by your staff and what is feasible and realistic in terms of resources and timing. And then it's really important at the end of that to be able to measure it, to say whatever we did, was it, was it useful and was it worth it? And the other thing that I just bring to you when we're talking about a healthy workplace is we normally think about it as these three elements that you'll see in the middle of the slide here. And that is, it's about healthy places and healthy vision and healthy people. So if we don't have this triangulation effect of these three core elements, it usually means that workplace health and wellbeing programs tend to fall over. Um, what we do see, say for example, is that you might suggest with your small team that you'll do a team building activity, or you might suggest with your small team that you're going to do a yoga class and people go, you know, five of them think, well, I'm really not that interested in that. Three of them might rock up for the first week and then it drops off. But without thinking about those other elements of what's happening in your business plan and your vision and, and is the culture within your organisation supporting wellbeing, well then your workers may not attend or come along. And vice versa, if you haven't got the right environmental set up and your lighting is not great and um, you're not in an environment that feels good and looks good, well then you're going to have some issues there as well. So really important to talk about those three elements. I'm not going to go into too much detail today of this whole model. What, I've, um, what I'm doing towards the end of the presentation really is just giving you a few little snippets about what's kind of most important from a small business feel. Um, but this guide certainly is one that can guide you. But when we ask workers, well, what is health and wellbeing in the workplace mean? Like, what does that actually look like to you? So let's flip to this, this slide that talks about, I showed you one that's the individual uh, health and wellbeing. Uh, from the Future of Works report. So this is what the Future of Works report asked when people said, well, actually, what does workplace wellbeing mean to you? Um, how might that look? And the first one is a pleasant work environment. And you would think, you know, we can't underestimate the value of what relationships are like within a workplace and how important they are. Um, you know, the fact that people might say hello to each other and actually ask them how they are rather than just getting in and getting stuck into work. Um, the second one is about realistic work expectations and this certainly is, a, a, is one that comes in under psychological risk as well about job demands and high job demands and low job demands and we all have different expectations in regards to what's achievable and what's not achievable and so in this regard and realistic work expectations it's, it's good to be having conversations with staff very regularly about where they are at with the jobs that they've got at hand and what's their priorities and what's their timing. And that's also a recommendation for yourself um, to ensure that you're looking at what you're doing is really feasibly possible to be able to do without thinking about whether things need to be outsourced or, um, you know, without putting out spot buyers all the time as well. 
flexible working hours comes through really quite strongly too when we're thinking about workplace wellbeing. Um, from a COVID perspective, this has changed a lot in our society where a lot more people are working from home. Um, their, their office is their home office, so they've got a little bit more flexibility in that. But we also need to ensure then that there are uh, proper procedures and policies wrapped around that and that there's trust both ways in this relationship when we've got flexibility and work life. Um, so there's some really good resources and tools to support that. And I think the other important component here is that when we look at this, so much of it has actually got to do with communication and connection. Um, and it's you know got some really strong relevance in terms of what's the culture of your business. So as you're building your small business, certainly to bring through that element of uh, how you support wellbeing and how strong it is in your business and making sure as you build your vision statements for your business, um, when you're writing your business plans, that they strongly include these elements of health and wellbeing for yourself and for your employees. And your employees certainly will want to take your lead. So if, uh, if you're able to walk the talk when you're thinking about health and wellbeing, it's really, really important. The other important aspect is, is that, you know, the business benefits of health and wellbeing within the workplace is, is really quite strong. We know that healthier workers are happier workers and they are less likely to take sick leave, which means that less likely to keep businesses in the lurch if they're at work working. We also know that healthier workers are more productive and we know that workplaces where they know that their health and wellbeing is important and that they can be looked after and that they're cared for are going to be more loyal. So they're going to be a more gauged and they will also, you know, go the extra mile when required. Um, so the benefits of having a healthy workplace really are so important and in particular in that small business sense, it's really, um, it's really key to keep your business ticking over and moving. Uh, some of the statistics talk about there being for every dollar invested in health and wellbeing can provide at least a $2.30 return, but in small business it can be up to $16 return in that $1 investment. So a key area for you to be able to spend some time actually, um, and not you might not necessarily be investing financially, but just time working with your employees and with yourself on health and wellbeing. Lead with that in charge. Uh, and I, I usually say to people, what are the three things that you value most in life? If I just give you a second to think about that. What are the three things that you value most in life? Okay, now that you've had to think about that just for that couple of minutes, a lot of people will say that they value family. They value friendship. They value their job and their work. But usually one of the top ones that come in is that you value health. If you don't have your health, your employees don't have their health, it impacts on everything. But it's one of those things that we just don't necessarily address all the time. So not only is there financial implications, we need to know that we care for people and that we're going to be in a supportive environment to do that. So what can you do? Here are my sort of um, top tips from a small business perspective about what's important and how you can practically implement health and wellbeing within your workplace. So number one is about your healthy workspace and place. Um, this slide here is from a small business owner who works from home. She sent this through to me and said, hmm, this is not how I should really have my office set up at home. You know, washing on the table, computer, you know, little laptop sitting up on the computer, um, sorry, little laptop sitting up on their work desk, it's just chaotic um, and, and there's this great quote here that says there's something to be said to the lack of um, anxiety that comes from a clean and comfortable workspace where you think, think that things aren't piling up all around you and overwhelming you. So it's something small but where you can try and have your workspace wherever it be, be as organised as possible, be it organised to yourself. There's some also great evidence that talk about having wood around you and having greenery around you. So I just encourage wherever your workspace is, is to provide as much sort of wood and greenery as possible within your workplace and space. 
And for those two of you who do have office environments um, or workspace environments, not necessarily even office environments, but just a workspace where people come to, it's really important to have well-stocked lunchrooms, um, facilities for people to bring their own lunch in. So you're getting enough good nutrition in the day to be able to sustain you throughout your business day. Uh, it's the, uh, I don't know, sometimes I don't know where all those forks, knives and spoons go, but they're constantly disappearing. Um, having microwaves, a fridge, those types of elements in terms of a healthy workspace are really important. So that's my number one tip there, is just to try and create as much as you can, that, that positive working environment. If your desk setup is really quite good, you're going to find that you'll be able to breathe easier and be able to concentrate for long periods of time. My number two tip is around creating these healthy cultures. And so we've spoken about this a little bit, but you know, communication is really key in this area. It's, it's about respectful relationships with each other. Uh, it's also about communication from um, yourself as a leader or for those who are around you who may be leaders about there being, what, what are the values in the business that is going to create this healthy workplace culture? What's the meaningful work that you're providing to your staff and ensuring that you can uh, reward and recognise that work that's being undertaken? And this one, in terms of healthy cultures, it's also important to be able to have those difficult conversations and to be able to practice those difficult conversations. So conflict resolution and management is really quite tricky. If that's not something that you've done before, I'd suggest that you go to the Fair Work um, Commission's website. They've got some great free training around difficult conversations and how to have those with employees when required. Uh, but sometimes this just builds up within a culture and then it just becomes the norm. Uh, there's also some really good tools and resources on the Heads Up website if you feel like you've got a worker um, that is struggling and you want to support them and have those difficult conversations. So you can do some training on there about how to have those difficult conversations to give you feeling like you've got that confidence to be able to go down that track. Um, and the last one is around those positive work health and safety practices. And so whether you've got one employee or 10 employees, you still need to have a work health and safety management system and safety and well-being certainly within that culture needs to be promoted from the start so your staff feel like that they're in a safe working environment. So that leads me on to number three, uh, which is around creating healthy policies. You know, quite often we know that there is this legislative component around work health and safety and it can be really quite overwhelming for small business to consider these. But a couple of the key ones, a couple of the must have ones, I think that really sit within this workplace health and wellbeing that are really quite relevant and important to you. Uh, and again, a lot of these you find on the Safe Work website if you don't have them and you need to create some version of a work health and safety system. But the first one is a work health and safety policy. And in particular, with wellbeing, ensuring that that is woven into your work health and safety policy. So having that up front. The second one is around bullying, harassment and discrimination. So we quite often see that this is the, you know, one of the key issues that concerns wellbeing within the workplace and mental health and psychological risk. So again, up front, if you've got bullying and harassment policies and procedures that your staff know about, that you're confident comfortable in um, progressing. That's definitely number, um, number two. Codes of conduct and how you expect your staff to behave and, and yourself as, um, as owners, certainly very important. Your leave policy, uh, what that looks like, how staff know that they can take time out when they need it, ensuring that their entitlements are, um, are all on track. A drug and alcohol policy, which sometimes fits in with fitness for work, but ensuring that you've got those elements covered within your business um, is important. It's always important also to have those grievance policies and any sort of performance counselling or disciplinary action. So again, if you're going to a place where you might know that there's a work to be struggling or yourself, it's, it's sometimes it's a fine line with this performance management and um, discipline policy. But if that's there up front and you know your expectations and they know your expectations, it takes a lot of stress 
out of the situation. And then the last one is a working from home policy. So as I mentioned, we know that a lot of small business owners and staff work from home. It's really important to have this work from home policy in place um, to ensure that that place of work for your workers is a safe environment for them to be working in. Uh, and so there's again some really good policies out there now for to support you in this element. It just kind of sets the backbone, I guess, to any conversation that you need to have with your employees. Tip number four is around creating healthy people. So we know we know that being a healthier worker is uh, really important for so many aspects. We know that health is important for our health and well-being, and it can be really difficult at times to remain constantly in this healthy environment. And we know that by telling someone to stop smoking is not necessarily going to make them stop smoking. But there are some things in the workplace environment that we can help to support and encourage around healthy lifestyle behaviours. And one of them is having healthy food and drinks at work or encouraging elements of that. So we normally go for a sort of an 80-20 rule. If you're having a morning tea or a lunch or putting on um, some elements, of an activity or an event for your staff where you can, provide a choice. Any healthy food, 20 not so healthy food. Rather than there being biscuits all the time, be able to provide some fruit at times. So that's one um, important element. Second, second element here is about a responsible drinking culture. Um, so this relates to uh, sort of the alcohol and drug component. We know that we can't control what people do outside of work, but in the work environment, we certainly can have this culture where we're not necessarily going and having multiple drinks all the time and condoning a, 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 a drinking culture. So where you can, um, you know, if, if that's what's happening at the moment, try to ensure that you have other activities that aren't just around that drinking culture. Smoke-free workplaces, are, it's quite common now. We've come a long way from a public health perspective in, in supporting workplaces to be smoke-free and smoke-free policies. And uh, it's a really good example of how we've seen reductions over the years in smoking rates across, um, across the country. So that one most people probably do do already. Participate in health events. So, you know, it's at the moment, um, October, and it's Mental Health Month. And so there's lots of things that are happening, but other health events include Movember or breast cancer awareness. If you have a think about what you think is important to you and to your staff, and maybe if there's personal circumstances or stories and you can get on board with those health events and just help drive change in that month, it's a really small little thing that you can do around creating health and wellbeing for your individual people. Um, Christmas is going to be here before we know it, I dare say that. And so healthy gifting is another element you can do. So often when it comes to people's birthdays or, you know, comes to Christmas, we do tend to give chocolates and wine. Um, it could be the opportunity for you to think about a healthy gift and you might give a plant instead or you might give, um, you know, a, some kitchen utensils or just there's different thoughts that can go into providing a healthier gift rather than um, providing one that may not be so healthy. And communicating free services that are available for your staff to utilise and for yourself is really important. So we are quite lucky here in um, South Australia that there's some really great um, programs that you, you can offer up to your employees. Um, it's not to say that you're telling them that they must do, but if a worker comes to you and or you're having conversations and you know that they're struggling with their weight or with eating or with smoking, there's usually a service for that. And sometimes people just need to be um, shown a little bit of a direction or even to know that it exists. So we've got the Get Healthy program here in South Australia that gives you coaching sessions with uh, either a dietitian or a exercise physiologist um, to help get people on track in relation to their health and wellbeing. Um, so that's a really good service. We also have the quick line if you know that there's people wanting to um, give up smoking. And there are a lot of support services for uh, mental health and wellbeing, which would, my main one would be the Head to Health website. Uh, so there's a lot of aspects and you'll see many of those services listed in the guide that I spoke about. Uh, so I would suggest that you have a look in there and find out what's available for your staff to help them um, to create that 
healthy workplace and healthy people. Um, you can even do a challenge with your workers. I mean, it's it's often our work colleagues that support us through tough times, but they also help support us through our times of when we're looking to change. And, you know, it will be, um, it's kind of exciting when you know you've got the other workmates on your side when you're trying to change those lifestyle habits. So I hope those have helped. They've just been small quick tips on how you can um, look to workplace health and wellbeing and things that you can do for yourself and your workers. But the other element we really wanted to highlight today is that as a small business owner, that your, your health matters, your individual health and wellbeing matters. And it's a really important business strategy. And for those of you who have gone through the process of business planning, um, I hope that within your business plan, you've got a mitigation or a strategy in there when you're looking at your risk management about things potentially going wrong in your business, that one of those elements is things not happening right with your health. And I know it sounds really not very awful, but these circumstances can come up. It may be it may be a heart attack or it may be cancer or it may be stress with mental health. But as part of your risk management and your business plan, it's really important for you to consider if you were to become unwell, what would you do? And by planning that right from the beginning, it helps actually just take some of that stress away already. So just recommend that you go back and do that. Who would you talk to? Who might you help with your business at that stage? Who knows information around your business to help support you get through that process? Because you are really important. So the second part of our guide um, talks about this. We, we talk about this. Um, in relation to this unbalanced, you know, work life. Is there such a thing as work life balance? It's a, you know, it's a bit of a nebulous concept. And as small business owners, usually work life balance really doesn't exist. It's a merge of both. So what what we try to encourage is that you actually need to bring yourself back into work. So it's not just work life balance. It's work life self balance. So Rather than this being this pendulum swing, you bring in elements of yourself. You put that into your diary. You make time for yourself because if you have got your own health and well-being in check, everything else will work so much better. And it's so important for you to not think about that as being selfish. It actually is self-care. And we've got seven tips in relation to that about what's important and what you can do. The evidence tells us to keep good well-being, these key components are really important. And one of those is connecting. So it's connecting with other people, connecting with family, connecting with friends, connecting with other business owners, going to events where you can connect in with others and be able to, um, to chat with them about what's going on. Number two is being active. There is no doubt that having exercise and activity in your life increases your endorphins that make you feel good. And so where you can ensure that you're putting some activity in your life. This doesn't mean tomorrow you need to go and sign up and do a triathlon straight away. This just means that you need to be as active as you possibly can and start small to get to that point of, um, you know, enjoying the feelings that come from being active. It's important for us to take notice. So, you know, quite often we are just either living so fast in the future and what needs to be done or we're living so you know much in the past of things oh I should have got done it's really important at times to take a breath and to take notice of what's happening in the here and now the fourth one is around keeping learning uh, I, I think every single day small business owner uh, owners are on a learning path and keep learning this is an important one about finding those little activities or hobbies that just spark an interest and a drive in you. Something that's just going to maybe get your headset away from work, but give you a little bit of um, fulfillment and well-being and something new that you can learn. Helping others is really important. It's that feedback back and forwards when you help someone else. Um, you get great feelings of being fulfilled knowing that you've done good for somebody else. So this might mean something small when you're at the shopping centre, you might see someone struggling and you will help them. Sometimes we're so busy we don't even feel like we can help someone. But where you can, really important to try and help other people. Oh, sleep. Such a hard, elusive one. 
Um, I'm not sure how many of you will probably wake up 3 a.m. with your mind ticking over about everything that needs to get done. And we're really good at um, having great sleep routines for the children and having like great sleep routines that we suggest to other people, but we don't often do that for ourselves. So in this guide, there's some really good tips about how important it is to get a good night's sleep. And the things that you need to actually put in place to wind you down. You know, how often do you switch your screens off next to you? Are you on your laptop at the end of the night? Are you on your phone at the end of the night? What do you do to help yourself wind down to get ready for a good night's sleep? And the last one is around eating right. So we know how important nutrition is to our general health and well-being. There's a lot more evidence coming out as well about how healthy eating affects mood. Um, as well. So certainly where you can ensure that you're getting your correct meals in a day and where you are getting in your correct nutrition elements to help fuel your body to thrive and to, um, to feel well and balanced. The other elements that we know with small business owners and for yourself as an individual is that um, a couple of key big stress points we know around uh, keeping up with compliance. So just to confirm with you a few different um, supports for that, it can be quite a tough, tricky area, but there are support services out there in particular for small business. So the Safe Work Advisory Service is one of those. If you haven't utilised those before, um, you can either go to their website or can give them a call and just ask them a general question around, I'm a small business owner, what do I need to do to comply? What's kind of like the bare minimum that's going to see me through? What have you got that can help me along this pathway? The Fair Work Commission also has some really good resource supports for you in that relation, in that regards, especially in regards to all the legislation for compliance um, components around employees. So I would do that one. And then the third one also is around joining an association. If you're not a member of an association that's a part of your industry, um, I would suggest that that's a really good option for you to join, to be connected in with others, and they often will provide lots of free opportunities to talk up, to talk to you about compliance components. And as a small business owner, we know that financial stress is also something that's really quite large. And so um, the two suggestions that I've got for there, if you haven't already seen these, um, is the Small Business and Family Enterprise um, Ombudsman. I can always have that one, a little bit difficult saying that. But they've got some great information on their website about um, your business and your health, um, how to set up financial components for your business, what supports are out there and available. And the National Debt Helpline is also a free service that's available. We know that small business owners, most of the time, have got really good relationships with a great accountant and bookkeeper. Um, and so that would be the other thing I would encourage in terms of mitigating some of those financial stresses that come along with being a small business owner. I'm going to finish off just with um, a couple of different other recommendations. If you're looking at creating a healthy workplace, the healthyworkplaces.sa.gov.au website is a great website that provides multiple tools and resources around creating a healthy workplace. Uh, it's a combination of multiple um, tools and resources that are out there. It's sort of like a one-stop shop for you. So I would suggest that you go there. You can also sign up and subscribe to get regular newsletters about upcoming events and any information that's um, pertaining to healthy workplaces. If you haven't been to the Heads Up website before, it is like um, the website for mental health. It's the website for business mental health, really. Um, and they have got fabulous tools and resources, particular for small business. So go onto the Heads Up website and find some great tools and resources for you. There's free training that, that's on there as well. There's policies that you can utilise. So it's a really good website. And as I mentioned, the Ahead for Business is for business. Uh, and they have got some great opportunities on there for you to take some time to answer a few little quick surveys to see where you're at with your wellbeing um, and then provide you some supports based on the questions that you have answered. So it's quite tailored. And the last one is the new access program. And we've got Mel joining us, who's going to talk to us now about the new access program. So I'll pass over to her. 
Hello everybody and thank you so much for attending my presentation today. It's a real pleasure to be here. Mental health is a really hot topic at the moment. It seems to be on everyone's lips and there's particular focus on the impact of mental health issues on the small business community. So I'm delighted to be given the opportunity to talk to you today about mental health within the small business community um, and what steps can be done to take care of small business owners and make sure that they're getting the help they need by offering some solutions that may help them. We've got some great solutions available from Beyond Blue, which I'll be delighted to discuss with you today. So in terms of what we'll be discussing in today's presentation or the purpose of today's session is we'll be talking about the mental health continuum and signs to look out for. This is a really great way of discussing what mental health is and also what it isn't. So when we're talking about mental health, what exactly is it that we're talking about? We also have an in insight into small business owners in Australia. Why are they an at-risk group? What sort of stresses are they exposed to that puts them at risk of mental health and what can be done to overcome that? We'll introduce new access for small business owners, which is a new program which was launched earlier this year by Beyond Blue, which looks at solutions to help small business owners overcome mental health challenges. We'll take a deep dive into some of the small business stresses that in particular small business owners are exposed to. We know there's lots of stresses in life that can really impact people with their mental health, but there's particular mental health stresses that small business owners are exposed to. So we want to take a deep, deep dive into those and look at what could be done to prevent them. We'll look at the data from the program. So new access was launched in March and that's given us a good few months to be able to get some data and be able to see who's accessing the program so far, who is inquiring and what, what story does that tell? How, what kind of pieces can we put together to learn from the program so far to help small business owners, not only now, but in the future? I'll talk through some helpful resources and then have an option for some Q&A at the end of the presentation. So mental health is a very popular topic at the moment, and there's lots of people who are impacted by mental health issues, not only in Australia, but all over the world. It's a real global issue at the moment. But when we're talking about mental health, what exactly are we talking about? When we're talking about mental health, we're not just talking about mental illness. And mental health, perhaps one of the easiest ways to discuss it or describe it is by talking about it existing on a continuum with flourishing at one end and severely impacted at the other. And it's shown really well, it's, it's um, illustrated really well on this slide. Flourishing is the blue end of the spectrum, which is really nirvana. This is where you know the perfect mental health, where there's no issues whatsoever. You can engage, you're responsive, you're highly resilient, um, and you've developed coping strategies and skills to be able to deal with any stresses that may come your way. And this is a great place to be. The other end of the spectrum, you've got almost like a sliding scale polar opposite. Severely impact is where we see the red color here. And this is people who perhaps are sadly um, really struggling with their mental health. These are people who may be self-harming. Um, these are people who may be attempting suicide or having thoughts about suicide. They're in that suicide ideation stage, which is very dangerous. Um, and this is where this, this group is at a severely high risk um, of, of harming themselves. So we've got two polar opposites here, and then there's a range in between, and people can move up and down the spectrum. It's not static. Mental health is not something that's set in stone. It can move along the spectrum, depending on what happens in your life. Um, certain things, triggers that we're exposed to, um, can move, it cause you to move up and down the spectrum. Um, at, at various times, some people feel that they move up and down the spectrum on a daily basis, not only monthly or on a yearly basis, depending on things that may happen in our life. They say that the best place for us to aim to be is in the green, and that's a healthy, healthy stage. Um, 
healthy stage for us to be where we're really we're able to to cope with things in life and develop strategies to be able to to deal with things and there's some really useful ideas that are included in this continuum to give you ideas about wherever you may be along that range um, there's warning signs or triggers that might identify towards you that maybe you're you're moving down the spectrum um, and need to assess um, triggers that you might be exposed to or, or, or stresses that you might be exposed to. So if you do feel yourself getting tired, for example, or withdrawing, not wanting to spend time with your friends, or you feel that you're having trouble sleeping, or you can't complete tasks that you normally had no issue with whatsoever, these are signs that perhaps you're moving down the spectrum and it gives us an opportunity to address these issues before it's potentially too late. Now, in terms of small business, small business owners are at a high risk when it comes to mental health. And there's various reasons for that. I think, first of all, it's really important to point out how significant the small business community is in Australia. 97% of businesses in Australia are sole operator and small business, which is just fantastic. This, this group of people, this group of um, this community is really the backbone of the Australian economy. Um, we've got 2.3 million businesses in Australia and 62% of those work on a sole trader basis. Almost half of all Australians are employed by a small workforce, a small business, which is just incredible. Research was conducted last year that looked at the impact of the pandemic on the small on small business owners and, and what impact that had on their mental health. And it was quite disturbing. It showed that 25% of small business owners reported a high level of psychological distress. 36% of sole traders reported a high level of psychological distress. And this really was um, evidence which stood alone and was different from business owners who worked in medium to larger size organisations who didn't show that same level of psychological distress. Of course, COVID has been uh, a huge impact in this area. The impacts of COVID over the last 12, 18, 20 months has had a significant impact on the mental health of small business owners. I don't think there's been a small business owner that hasn't been impacted by the effects of COVID. Um, there's been a, a hashtag that went around at the beginning of last year, which was, we're all in this together. That was a hashtag that was used very much so to say, you know, we're all collaborating, we're all in this together. And the problem was a lot of small business owners didn't feel that way. Being a small business owner, you can often feel like you're left alone, you're forgotten about, and nobody really cares because you're on your own in your business. And of course, we've seen the impact of lockdowns and restrictions, businesses having complete uncertainty about the future, whether they're going to be able to open, whether they, if they are open, if they'll have to close again. Um, some businesses have had to apply for government benefits for the first time, and they've had to navigate this journey often on their own, not knowing where, where to go or, or where to get help. And this has been um, incredibly stressful for a number of small business owners and has led to much higher levels of mental health issues being reported. So I mentioned earlier about some research that was conducted into the mental health of small business owners. And this research was done last year in 2020. And it really looked at the impact of the pandemic on the mental health of small business owners. And it was it was compelling and found that there had been a significant impact um, on the mental health of small business owners. And as a result of this, the government decided that they wanted to fund uh, a program to support small business owners. And this led to the development of new access for small business owners. It's a jointly conceived initiative between Beyond Blue and Asbifio. And Effectively, what the program is, if I'm going to describe it in the most simple way, is it's a mental health coaching program for small business owners. You have to be a small business owner in order to qualify. It's not available to everyone. And in order to be considered as a small business owner, you have to have less than 20 staff. It's as simple as that. There's no need for you to provide financials or show profit or loss. It's simply a case of are you a small business owner and do you have less than 20 staff? And if that's the case, you're able to participate in the program. 
what makes the program really unique is that the coaches who deliver the coaching are actually people who've come from a small business background themselves. So they're not physicians, they're not clinicians, they're not therapists, they're not psychologists. They're actually people who've run a small business themselves. So they understand what it's like to work in the small business landscape. They understand what the challenges are and they can talk to participants with empathy and compassion and they're much more relatable than perhaps what you would find in a clinical setting. The program is scheduled to run for 12 months. So it started in March this year. So it's scheduled to run until March next year, although we are being given strong indication that the program will be extended due to the level of inquiries um, that the program has had, particularly as a result of the lockdowns and restrictions we've seen that have impacted this community so significantly. There's no need for a doctor's referral and the program is completely confidential. This is really important because a lot of participants, a lot of small business owners who are going through issues, um, maybe they're going through financial issues, they're having problems with paying bills or they're having issues with creditors. They were very worried about this getting out into the open and it potentially affecting their business or their reputation. So it's very important that this program is confidential. Whatever is discussed between the participant and the coach remains between the participant and the coach. It's completely confidential. It's a free program. So there's six coaching sessions. Each session lasts between 45 minutes to an hour and it's completely free. And it's also accessible, highly accessible. So it's available between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Meaning that small business owners can log, in, log on via video conference like what we're doing now or they can call on the phone between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. so they can call from home or call from work, whatever is easiest for them. So why small business owners? I know I talked a little bit about the research that was done and this research really took a deep dive into the psyche of small business owners and looked at, well, why? Why do we need to build this program for small business owners in particular? And there was three key reasons that stood out. One of them was that small business owners are incredibly time poor, and this was a real barrier to them seeking help. So in the research that was done, small business owners often said, you know, I'm, I've acknowledged that maybe I'm suffering with depression or I've got problems with anxiety or my mental health is suffering but I just don't have time to book an appointment with a psychologist or a therapist because I'm so busy with my business and trying to juggle all of these demands. So this issue of having no time was a real problem. We also found that small business owners tended to prioritize the needs of their business and others over their, over their own needs. So they often had um, staff for example they were very worried about their staff and wanted to take care of their staff rather than taking care of their own needs they put their business and the needs of others ahead of themselves and finally there was great stigma within this group we we know that there is stigma associated with mental health but there was great stigma within this group around success and winning um, and there was a feeling that if I if I go and get help or if I talk to someone, somehow it means that I'm not independent or I'm not successful or I'm not winning in business, which as a small business owner, they felt that there was expectation on them to, to win and succeed. And if you ask for help, somehow you're failing. And there was a real fear of failure. So all of these reasons became big barriers to small business owners reaching out for help, perhaps barriers that we don't see as much in the wider community. So in terms of the stresses themselves, we also took a deep dive into this and, and looked at well, what kind of stresses are small business owners exposed to, perhaps more so than the wider community. Um, and they're really very varied, um, but really quite significant as well in terms of the impact that they can have on someone's emotional um, and mental well-being. And these are things like having work-life balance, working long hours, cash flow, profitability, um, customer demands, competitor demands, um, worried about competitors, having high expectation of self, having conflicting demands between home and work, um, uh, regulation, compliance, 
um, demands from staff, worried about staffing issues, um, not having teams that are big enough to support you. Again, we're talking about small business owners who are often one-man bands, sole traders, they're doing everything on their own. Um, it can be very hard doing all of that on your own and not having teams that you can allocate or dele delegate work to. Um, often we see sole traders facing that isolation um, and having to having to cope with things alone and not having someone in the workplace to talk to. Um, we did find that sole traders in particular um, accounted for a lot of the people that accessed the program. Um, and this this was this was really telling when it came to thinking about isolation and communication and the importance of having somebody to communicate with at work. Um, what came out as really quite significant was three key issues for sole traders. The three key issues that they highlighted as their main stresses. And I think this is quite significant. So the first uh, reason that was the most significant was um, worry about family. So worrying about needing to spend so much time with your business that you're not spending enough time with your family and this constant worry that because I'm trying to focus on my business, I'm not being a good father or I'm not being a good mother or I'm not contributing enough to my family from a from a supporting them enough because I'm trying to grow my business. And this was a real worry um, for people who are running a small business. The second biggest worry was cash flow. Um, having to pay out big bills and then worry about what was coming in and, and was that cash flow significant? It was a constant worry for business owners. And then the final uh, worry that was the, the biggest stressor uh, was profitability. Is the business profitable? Will it be profitable? Is it profitable now? And will it be profitable in the future? This constant worry about having to grow the business and make sure it's profitable. So these are all reasons that indicate that the stresses a small business may be under um, perhaps are different and more significant than what we see in the wider community. So I just thought I would share with you some of the data that we're seeing from the program so far. As I as I told you, we have been um, engaging with participants since the program was launched in March. We've seen some really interesting data so far. Perhaps one of the most interesting forms of data is industry, looking at what industry are these small business owners coming from? And I apologize that this is a little bit small, but um, because there's so many industries on there, it's, it's, it is difficult for me to reflect that any larger, but where we're seeing the highest number of participants so far that are accessing the program, it's coming from arts and recreation, followed by health and social assistance, then retail, um, then other, which is a catch-all category where people perhaps can't find their uh, category that best defines their industry. So they take other accommodation and food and then professional um, science and tech are really the main. And then we get a smattering going through. What was really interesting about this is that um, the, the measure that we were using didn't include tourism. Um, and so we actually felt that people were ticking other if they came from the tourism industry, which we know has been significantly impacted um, by the by the pandemic. We also know that retail has been significantly impacted by the pandemic. And those in health and social care are probably really feeling the impacts of, um, of the pandemic, as are people in arts and recreation. This is a sector that pretty much hasn't been able to work as a result of the pandemic. Now, whilst I did mention tourism wasn't included, uh, we did include it as a sector from last month. So you'll see there's a small number that are coming through now. So what we anticipate we'll see is that the group that were ticking other will now start ticking tourism as we, we really do believe um, we had a high portion of people from the tourism sector who've been accessing the program. In terms of age and state, um, the, 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 the highest proportion of people that are accessing the service are aged between 35 and 44 and 45 and 54. And I think this really gives you an indication of how long people have been in business. These aren't business owners who've just started their business. They're not entrepreneurs. 
Um, these are people who are established in their business. You know, it's typically you're not going to find someone who's in their 40s who's a business owner who's new in business. These are typically going to be people who are established in business. We also find that those who are accessing the service, it's the first time they've accessed a mental health service or even the first time they've suffered with a mental health issue, which I think is quite telling as well. In terms of state, um, Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland are by far the largest states in terms of the participants we're seeing. Um, New South Wales and Victoria probably don't need any explanation given the lockdowns and restrictions that we've seen. Queensland is a little bit of a surprise because we've had a high level of participation all the way through from the very beginning of the program. And we think that's really a result of the impact of um, the lockdowns um, and, and border closures on tourism in Queensland because so many of the businesses in tourism are tourism related. But overall, we've seen participants from every area of Australia, every state and every area, which, you know, is, is promising to see on, on one hand, but it also shows that there's more work for us to do from an engagement point of view. In terms of gender, we are seeing more females access the program than males. And initially, if you look at this, you might think, well, does that mean that more female aligned business owners are uh, more female business owners are struggling than male business owners it's not necessarily the case uh, we do tend to find in even on other programs that we've run women do tend to reach out more than men and it's because women tend to show a higher level of help seeking behaviors than men um, and this has been consistent every month we've had more women than men and again it's an indication for us to do more with male aligned industries so we're trying to engage more with male dominated industries um, to really promote this program um, and to reach out to males um, male business owners who might be struggling or needing to talk to someone and then i've just included here as well the size of the business which i think is really telling as i mentioned to you before about sole traders um, we've just added a separate sector here for sole trader that's been added this month Prior to this month, the only data, data cap, the only data capture we captured was from one, all the way through to 20 employees to give us an idea of the size of the business. The problem we realise is that if you put down one, it doesn't necessarily mean sole trader. It could actually be someone who has one employee. So that's why we added sole trader this month. Uh, what we anticipate is that a lot of sole traders have been ticking one. And now they'll start ticking sole trader. So this um, bar we anticipate for the rest of the program will start to grow. But ultimately, what we believe is that the majority of people who are accessing the program are sole traders. And this really tells a story about isolation, um, working alone, um, not having anyone to talk to or connect with. And it, it talks about, it really tells a story about the power of connection. In terms of primary reason for referral, work-related stress, depression and anxiety are, are, are standouts here in terms of reasons why people access the service. And this has been consistent from the very beginning of the program. Um, we have a couple of other, other issues thrown in there, such as COVID-related stress and relationship stress. Interestingly, relationship stress is starting to increase. Um, and we have spoken to other um, mental health organisations who've said they've found the same thing after um, disasters, for example, such as fires or floods. You find that uh, stress, depression, anxiety tend to be the initial reasons why people access the service, but then that can have an ongoing effect on relationships. Um, and you tend to find relationship stress is an after effect as people struggle in their relationships as a result of having, having these mental health problems. Um, I've just included a statistic there because I think it's really important to show the number of inquiries we had when lockdowns were implemented. We had a 320% increase in inquiries when Melbourne, uh, sorry, Victorian lockdown was introduced um, back in June. Uh, we also saw another sharp increase in inquiries when the New South Wales lockdown was introduced. So we know lockdowns and restrictions have a significant impact on the mental health of small business owners. In terms of the results that we're seeing, the results, they speak for themselves. They're absolutely fantastic. Um, we've had so many small business owners come through the program who, quite frankly, when they come through, they have no hope. 
they are really really struggling and really challenged with everything that they're going through and through the six sessions that they work through with a coach they're able to find some solutions and they're able to build skills and coping strategies that not only help them deal with their immediate issues but actually help them build coping strategies and resilience and strength to cope with those issues if they arise in the future and that's really important so 93% of participants said the program helped them to better understand and address their challenges. 93% of participants felt more equipped to address similar issues if they arose in the future. 96% of participants would recommend NASBO to another small business owner and 89% of participants felt more productive and able to address business challenges as a result of the program. So it actually helped them from a business point of view, which is just fantastic. And I've included a testimonial there. Um, we get so many testimonials and um, wonderful feedback um, that we now start sending out to, to really promote the program because the, the results the program is having so far are really, really fantastic and really speak volumes about the ability to recover um, in a relatively short period of time if intervention uh, through this type of coaching is administered in the right way. So if you're interested in inquiring, um, perhaps there's something that's been covered today that makes you think this might be something that's relevant for you or perhaps there's a small business owner that you know that you think you know what if they haven't seemed like themselves I know that they've been struggling with lockdown and restrictions or um, you know they really have had a really tough time and it might be a good idea for them to talk to someone in a confidential environment uh, where no one needs to know it's a safe confidential environment with a small business owner with a coach who's come from a small business owner background just like them um, here are the contact details you can either inquire via the website there's a telephone number um, or there's the, an email um, that can be used so you can access the service in a variety of ways um, so thank you so much for attending this presentation today. It's always a, a great pleasure to be able to talk about the new Access for Small Business Owners program and, and, and also talk about mental health, a topic which is often shrouded with, with stigma. Um, and it's a great idea to be talking about this this month, which is Mental Health Month. So thank you all so much for attending this session and for attending this information session overall. Um, we really do appreciate it. And I hope you have a, a great day ahead. Hi, Mel. I just wanted to ask a question. If a small business owner is already seeking a therapist for support. Are they eligible um, to apply for the new access program? Thank you so much for asking that question. That's a great question. Um, so when it comes to eligibility, um, there are there's there's really two eligibility criteria. First of all, you have to be a small business owner, as I mentioned earlier, and have less than 20 staff. The other eligibility criteria is that you can't at that time um, be seeing a mental health specialist such as a, a counsellor or a therapist or a psychologist and, and going through um, a, a program um, with another mental health specialist and this might sound strange uh, but the reason for it is that when you're going through um, a, a level of intervention with one specialist it's seen that if you were to go through um, this coaching program at the same time the two interventions together could potentially be damaging for, for the participants. So the view is complete one program. So if you're on a mental health care plan, for example, with your GP and you're seeing a therapist, you might have 10 sessions, for example, complete those sessions and once they're over, you'll be able to take part in the NASBO program. If it's someone who's taking medication, but they're not seeing a psychologist, then that's fine. There's no issue with taking medication. It's just a case of if you're actually going through um, therapy um, or, or, or seeing a mental health specialist, it's, it's not possible to do this program at the same time. You can do it afterwards or do it before, but just not at the same time.